Okay, folks, we are going to get started in 32, and we're going to call this meeting to order. And Lori is going to share the upcoming housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our CEA board for Lori Tiketa. Here are today's housekeeping announcements for those of you here at the Ward Linger Building. The microphones will be on throughout the meeting. Uh, throughout the meeting, please remember to speak clearly, one person at a time, and please say your name when you start talking to people online and on the phone to follow the discussion. Um, we have no online board uh, participants nor no board participants today. For community members planning to speak during public comment periods, please come to the microphone if you or to the podium if you are able, so the microphone can pick up your voice. Um, online participants, click raise hand, that button in the webinar controls, or if you're on the phone, press star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute, and please raise your hand early so those of us uh, who are uh, staff supporting this meeting don't miss you. Public comment may be limited to three minutes at the chair's discretion. Emailed comments are being accepted at public comment at redwoodenergy.org until the chair closes the public comment period for that agenda item. Uh, if you are having difficulty and you're participating remotely, if you're having difficulty with your connection, if you can, please call or text us at 707-613-0622, 707-613-0622, or by emailing public comment at redwoodenergy.org. Trisha first. All right. Thank you, Lori. Um, we will do our roll call. And do we have any remote participation today? I see we don't have the screen, so I'm going to assume no. Okay. All right. Then we'll do our, our roll call. Okay. So, Director Arroyo here. Vice Chair Bauer is absent. Uh, Director Jorgensen here. Director Moldy here. Director, uh, Director Myers is absent. Director Ramos is absent. Director Stefani here. Uh, Chair Schaefer? Here. Director Tuttle is absent. Director Wilson? Here. Director Wu? Here. And there is a quorum for regular business. Thank you. Um, okay, we will move to item number two, reports from member entities. Does anybody have anything that they would like to report? Okay. Not seeing any reports, um, we will now move to oral written communication. So this is a time provided to address the board on matters that are not on the agenda. At the conclusion of communications, the board may respond to statements and any action um, will be set for a future agenda or referred to staff. So do we have anybody here in the public wishing to comment on items not on the agenda? Not seeing anybody making the move to the podium. Is there anybody online? Being online. All right. No, um, that will move us to item four, uh, the consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are enacted in one motion. There's no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, that item can be removed from consent separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, board members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for separate discussion. Item 4.1, approve the minutes of September 26, 2024 board meeting. Item 4.2, approve disbursements report. Item 4.3, accept financial reports. Item 4.4, accept quarterly regulatory and legislative policy engagement report. Item 4.5, appoint Elizabeth Burks as RCEA executive director and approve the agreement for employment of executive director. Item 4.6, authorize the executive director to execute the 2024-2027 PG&E funding agreement for 32, 32 million. $178,044 upon final review and approval by RCEA General Counsel and upon full execution, authorize the executive director to issue solicitation for consultant and subcontractor services to implement the Northern California rural REN in regions covered by PG and green funding. And item 4.7, approved resolution 2024-14, approving the form of and authorizing the execution of the Ashley Road Solar A Beam Tariff Power Purchase Agreement with RPCA Solar 5 LLC. Um, I am going to pull items 4.5 and 4.7. Are there any other uh, members of the board that would like to pull an item from consent? All right. And are there any members of the public that want to pull from consent? Not seeing. Uh, okay, so I will 
to take a motion for 4.1 through 4.4 and 4.6. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. So we have a motion by Director Arroyo and a second by Director Mobley. Um, we're all here, so we can do a show of hands, but so all in favor, aye. Aye. Passes. Um, and yeah, so okay, we'll move into the items pulled. Um, I pulled item 4.5, um, which is to appoint Elizabeth Burke for TBA executive director, um, which is super exciting. Our subcommittee did a gave the staff a lot and did a lot of interviews, and um, we're very excited about this appointment and just wanted to um, welcome Beth and give her an opportunity to come up and say anything if she would like to. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I just also want to bring that excitement and for taking on this role. It's a uh, like gold, my wildest dream, right? It's just uh, really the opportunity of a lifetime. I'm so grateful for uh, you know, going through this process and the confidence that you're all showing me by putting into this position. I am beyond excited to work with our CAD team. I really, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with them through my involvement with the CAC for a number of years now. And I know I'm just walking into um, really, you know, one of the best teams in the whole region. So, so grateful for that. Really looking forward to furthering our CEA's mission and, uh, yeah, just enhancing collaboration throughout the region and beyond. So thank you again. And I can't wait to, you know, have a chance to have one-on-one -on -one talks with all of you and, you know, make sure I'm understanding what you all need from the executive director. I really just hope I can hit the ground running in January and we're very much looking forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Um, all right. Are there any other public comments on item 4.5? Yes, or, or, or yes, or the board. Board. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank the um, all the directors who were on the committee, subcommittee, and the people I guess the CAC also weighed in. Thank you, staff. I know it was, I mean, everybody's busy, and this was a huge lift, but so important. So really, thanks a lot for doing all that. Thank you. Thank you. So. All right, and not seeing any other comment in the building. Um, for a motion. I'll move to approve the appointment of Huff Hertz as our CEA executive director and the agreement for employment. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the motion passes unanimously. And welcome, Beth. And we're looking forward to working with you. Um, and then I also pulled 4.7. Uh, it's not ready yet. So we're just going to. Push that to a future agenda. We have to have a motion for that. And so, no. Okay. Um, awesome. <laughs> um, so that's going to take us to item six, which is old CCE business. And we do have a quorum for CCE business. So that's going to be item 6.1, which is the energy risk management quarterly report. And um, Jacqueline Hart is here to give that update. Oh, everyone, on the data results, yes. put it in there. You want to click right there as well. Yes, thank you. Um, happy to see everyone. Be here in person. I hope you guys able to make the, the last one in person. So glad to be here. Uh, this is a standard energy risk management quarter to report. Um, focused on financials for this year. Uh, and as you can tell from all the green text, it's going to be a positive one. <laughs> so that's always exciting. Uh, for me to come up here and. Um, in green text news instead of red text news. Um, and actually, I also have some verbal updates uh, for some things that have shifted on rate design in the past 24 hours, actually, that I can speak to that, that aren't in the um, deck. But first, one uh, significant change that we made in the deck um, uh, after discussing with RCA staff is we're no longer showing an update from the previous um, quarterly presentation I have given but instead are showing an update from uh, the budget that the board adopted, the most recently adopted budget, which I think makes a lot of sense and you aren't like, trying to remember wait, what happened three months ago. And so you're like, you can go back to the same budget um, on every one of these updates. Um, so let's just jump into it. Um, on the revenue side, in 2024, we see retail revenues coming in lower than forecasted um, and lower than budgeted. Uh, this is primarily due to forecasting load being slightly down. Um, it's been a cool summer, relatively speaking, in California. Loads never really got very high, um, and so retail revenues are therefore depressed with the as well. And that's true for Redwood, true for basically every other 
entity that was um, looking at their loads at um, this year. Um, for the forecast for 2025 and 2026, uh, based on uh, this is based on an update that uh, PGE provided for their rate forecast several months ago. Um, as you can see, that was positive news. So um, improvement of 2.7 million dollars uh, in 2025 and 8.4 million in 2026. Uh, the third bullet there that the pg &E fall update was that be released this week. It was actually released late last night. We have not yet had a chance to get it into Redwood's um, portfolio to, to model exactly what the changes are financially, uh, but we have read through the entire document. Um, there is still some policy items up in the air on both the generation rate that pg &E will be charging uh, its customers and that Fred would, would then mirror um, with a slight rate discount. Um, there's also some up in the air policy items on the power cost and difference adjustment rate. Um, I'll get more into that in a couple of slides, but the what was initially set forth, forth in the update for um, that was issued uh, at the end of yesterday evening would have been significantly actually more positive than the numbers that you're going to see now. Um, I'll probably on the, the magnitude of um, you know, double digit million dollars. So that's really great. Um, as I stated, there's some policy wrangling happening, um, but I would say that at the very least, it's not going to be any worse than what you're seeing here. Uh, not going to state my reputation on it because things always change in this industry. But you know that I think that's where the the winds are are leading. For like this one. Um, on the net power costs, um, power costs are also down, which is fantastic news. Um, energy prices have been down uh, both in twenty twenty four and in future years. Um, as everyone here on the board knows, California has been on this big endeavor of building more and more uh, renewables and battery storage within the state. And it seems like power prices are finally catching up to that fact and that we have more resources um, in the supply stack and that is their full pushing pricing. Yeah, great. So that's positive. Um, there's been movement up and down on RECs and RA pricing, but overall I would say those pricing, those, those uh, resources or products pricing is also down. So that's also positive. Still quite high compared to a few years ago. But down from where they were a few months ago, and this budget was initially set. Um, and then one other item I would note that's not really captured here on the slide, but um, as the board is aware, we've moved into a new RA regime for 2025, which is a slice of day RA regime. Instead of one hour of um, RA compliance uh, on a monthly basis, there's a, a number that you need to comply with for every hour. So 24 numbers that you need to comply with on a monthly basis. Uh, that's made it a lot more complicated both to do the right power procurement as well as to um, predict costs because there's different products that you can buy that help in some hours and don't help in other hours or there's some products that help in all of the hours. Um, so it's just made it a lot more complicated to predict pricing. We tried to stay relatively conservative in our assumptions for 2025 RA pricing and then we try to you know beat that conservative assumption in the actual procurement that we've done. Um, as of today, it's looking like Redwood will be fully compliant for the year ahead RA fine showing, which will be um, uh, filed uh, a week from today. And we'll be able to bring that in at uh, cost significantly below what we were previously doing. So basically, uh, my portfolio manager saw that as a challenge to be like, oh, you know, this is what we think, this is the number we have to be. How much can we be? And they've been really kind of piecing things together. A jigsaw puzzle back uh, process to um, to get our uh, RCH compliance. That's something we're really excited about. All right. So moving on with kind of the financial outlook. Um, you know, what are the main things that are affecting the financial outlook? As already discussed, the PG rate changes are the biggest drivers here. Um, given that Redwood uh, adopts, uh, you know, uses PG rates to um, set its own rates with a discount. Um, another item that is not explicit here in the financial outlook, but is something that we should be discussing, is the financial security requirement calculation. Um, more on that in a couple of slides. Um, and then one piece that impacts uh, 
both the rates that RCA customers see as well as the prices that um, RCA pays for some of the products it procures are the market price benchmark. Um, and that um, impacts in two ways, which we'll get into uh, on the next slide. So basically, uh, increase in the market price benchmark means that the PCI, that is a rate charged to regular customers and as well as bundled customers, that, that rate goes down, which is good news. Um, but an increase in the market price benchmark means that some of the products that regulars are procuring go so first, what is the financial security requirement? This is an um, item that uh, the CPC requires all CCAs to hold um, that is meant to uh, secure if a CCA were to go out of business and all of those customers, customers would be put involuntarily back with the investor owned utility who is the provider of the last resort in California. Uh, then what is the cost that that investor utility would suddenly have to manage? To manage the administration burden of bringing all those customers back in and buying power products for them you know, kind of on the spot market. Um, so the financial security uh, requirement is recalculated every six months. Um, and for, I believe, the history of Redwoods um, being in operation as a CCA, uh, the FCR has been sort of at its minimum threshold, which right now is 147,000, which is not really a lot of money when you think of it as things, it, given the, the the dollars that we deal with here in the energy market, right? That's not a very large sum when you think about six months worth of, of costs. Um, and it's calculated through a complex equation that is set forth by CPUC policy. Uh, the expectation is the financial security requirement will be going up next year at the next recalculation at the end of this year. Uh, what that will be is still under discussion because while there is an equation that describes how it's supposed to be calculated as an all things energy market policy, you know, there, there's a lot of nuance and entities can debate. Um, the, the item I'd say here is that CalCCA is very actively involved in this discussion um, trying to support having a FSR that is lower than investor and utilities would like to put it. Um, and you know, we will see where, where that settles. When the FSR is recalculated, that is cash that would have to um, leave Redwood's account and then go sit into an account that would not be managed by, by Redwood. So not be cash that you would have on hand. It's still your money, but you no longer have the ability to invest in compensation. Uh, until the next FSR is recalculated. Uh, so that's just something to be aware that that is coming at some point in the coming years. Uh, market price benchmarks. So market price benchmarks are a calculation that is done throughout the state by all uh, load serving entities um, that are CQC jurisdictional, where the CQC asks um, entities, how much did you pay for RA over this time period? How much did you pay for PCC1 reps? All these different uh, different um, products. How much did you pay for it? And then the CPC uses those numbers, and they're all confidential, obviously, uh, to calculate what is sort of the market price for these products that are not traded openly, um, but are traded in a bilateral way. And then that benchmark price is utilized to calculate the value of the different products that are in the investor home utilities portfolio, some of which were purchased on behalf of Redwoods customers before they left to became Redwood customers back when they were bundled customers. So it then flows into the power cost of the adjustment calcula calculation, uh, which I'll have another slide on that breaking that down a little bit further, but just to go into what are the market price benchmarks, we have market price benchmarks set for energy, uh, that is a product that is, in fact, openly traded as a forward price curve, um, but the CPC calculates a kind of an MPV for, for energy, both on peak and off peak energy. Uh, an MPV is calculated for RA um, and its distinct flavors of system local and flexible RA. And then from renewable energy, um, both PCC1 as well as PCC2 and PCC3 calculation. And as the second main goal, it says uh, market price benchmarks are used for sort of two main functions. One is they're used to calculate, help calculate the PCIA, 
that both the investor owned utilities funding customers as well as our CAs customers pay. Um, and the next slide breaks that down a little further. And then they're also used to set the prices for the voluntary allocations that some CCAs have voluntarily opted into from the investor owned utilities. And Redwood is one of these um, CCAs, specifically when the voluntary voluntary allocation process opened up a couple of years ago, um, Redwood staff, um, in discussion with TA staff, decided to opt for uh, a partial allocation of what it could get for renewable energy from each of these portfolio. And the rationale behind this was that, you know, one, we don't know exactly what the market price benchmark will be, but it'll be around the market average. So if you want that renewable energy in your portfolio, this is a reasonable way to get, you know, an average cost uh, renewable product into your portfolio. But moreover, um, part of the voluntary allocation that PG&E was offering were long-term recs. Um, so recs that would be uh, a 10-year contract for longer in length. And that's valuable to Redwood because that helps meet RPS and compliance requirements. Um, and was particularly important because of the delay in the sense of the solar project coming online, which is already supplying test energy to the grid. I think 98.8% of panels are online operational. and operational. We're really excited to have that project go fully live uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, anyway, so Redwood opted into getting part of the voluntary allocation. So with the market price benchmarks going up, that means that portion of Redwood's environmental term um, of the, the recs that you're being from pg e through this, the price of that has gone up. But it also impacts, um, so skip one more slide to here, also impacts the PCA. Um, and the way it impacts it is actually pretty important. Basically, for all of these resources um, that are in pg es portfolio that were procured on behalf of um, all bundled customers before Redwood customers left to join Redwood, um, those resources can be above market in costs. So their costs are higher than the revenues that they gain in the market. So the way that the PCI is calculated is first, what are the costs of those resources? Like what are the PPA costs for all these resources or for the ones that pg &E owns and operates and the, the cost to keep these uh, projects maintained and operating? And then you subtract out the value that these resources earn in the, in the market. Um, what they earn in the energy market is very clear. Right? It's just what, what revenues do they receive from the tech. So, but what is the value of the RA that they're providing and what is the value of the, the recs that they're providing? That's less clear because um, that's a bilaterally traded market. And so that's what the market price benchmarks are used to do they're used to uh, help um, determine what that portfolio value should be. And then the so cost minus value gets you to what the PCI rate is set at, which is just what are the, the total above market costs net of value um, that all customers need to pay since these resources are procured on behalf of all customers back in the day. Um, so if you go back to the slide that I skipped over, and I go back, Sorry. Also can't go forward anymore. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, so here's here's where the, the market price benchmarks uh, were set for 24 and where they're currently forecasting for 25. Um, so you know that there's nothing in 24 for the final market price benchmarks for energy. That's because while we forecast what it might be in the future, when it comes to actual 2024, it's just what, what was the energy revenue that all of the resources in this portfolio earned. Um, so you don't need to calculate what's the actual final numbers. But you do need to calculate what's the value of the RA and the RPS. So you can see that the pricing there um, was relatively low for 24. Um, and this represents the lag that we see in RA prices have been steadily increasing over time. The market price benchmark is sort of a lagging indicator of that. So the market price benchmark was really showing prices that occurred in 23. And so that was set, used to set pricing for 2024 for the market price benchmark. Now we're trying to forecast what's going to go into the market price benchmark for 25. And we're starting to look at RA prices over the past year, which things were higher. 
So you can see that the system price uh, forecast for 25 RA is now $42, whereas it was 28 previously. Um, and so that is actually, you know, overall, that's just the RA price increasing is just an overall net benefit to Redwood because this is going to decrease the PCA and you aren't getting any sort of voluntary RA allocation. However, RPS adder, uh, you can see it is also increasing significantly from what was it was set in 24 to what the forecast is for 25. Um, and so that is going to be more of a mixed bag for Redwood because it will lead to a decrease in the PCA that your customers are paying, which is great news. However, it will lead to an increase in the amount that you are paying for the recs you're getting for the monetary allocation. Um, so that's for the benchmark price benchmark details. So we move on uh, a couple of slides is, you know, going kind of just digging in deeper on the PCA is that traditionally um, the PCA has been a positive value, which means it's a net negative to Redwood uh, and its customers. Um, and it's adds a cost to, to uh, Redwood's customers because the market price benchmarks uh, were, were low compared to what the cost were that actually occurred. Um, now that the mar market price benchmarks are increasing, that's causing the PCA to then decrease. Um, but then, as I just said, we're seeing RA prices drop, we're seeing environmental prices drop, so then in the future, the market price benchmark will go back down, and then the PCA will go back up, and we go through this kind of swinging process in the market, which is very unfortunate from a a right setting perspective, this was the world that we're left with when you go through all this policy um, complications. So if we look at historically, how has the, the PCA changed over time? Um, this is in dollars or really cents over on the left um, and going through time from 2012 through today, you can see that it has zigzagged quite a bit. And I think I joined Redwood um, right when we were at the, uh, uh, you know, I, I joined right when it bumped up to the, the high water mark. And so I think my first few presentations to the board were always like bad news because the PCA was so high and it was leading to uh, quite a, a, a net revenue shortfall. Um, for the past few years, we've been existing in a, a world where the PCA has been relatively low. Um, and we expect that to continue for at least another year or so before it probably starts bumping back up again. Um, so that kind of leads to kind of the, the final, you know, so what slides of what is the annual net revenue forecast um, for 2024 and future years. Um, and it's positive compared to what you saw in the May budget. Um, so first for October uh, for 2024, you can see that there's a slight increase overall in the expected annual net revenue forecast. This is primarily uh, costs have been slightly lower than expected. Um, revenues, as mentioned, have stayed the same to be slightly less because of less loads, um, but overall improvement um, for your 2024. This is pretty pretty locked and loaded unless we have some wild pricing event in December. And even then, it's still pretty locked and loaded. So this is positive. For 25, we're no longer in a, a deficit. Right now, the forecast is positive by 3.3 uh, million. So that's great news. And as mentioned, with the latest rate um, items that uh, pg e issued um, last night, I would say that the 3.3 million is probably up to war. Again, barring any wild market um, up war. Uh, and it may be, you know, you may creep into double digits in terms of the, the net revenue the next time we read on this analysis incorporating uh, the latest uh, rate updates from pg e um, and then 2026, a little further out, but also, you know, a, a positive of uh, 8 million, which is an increase over the 6.7 million in the budget forecast. And I think one more slide here is just the, the two-year cash projection. So, you know, previously we had for the time period, October through uh, of 24 through um, end of September 26, it kind of ended at almost the same place it, it started, maybe a teeny bit lower, in fact. Um, now we see, see growth over the time period. So you can see that we're starting a little bit lower than we have previously expected. That's actually really just a, um, a modeling 
thing because we've had mills come in a little bit earlier than, than we were previously modeling. You can see that uh, by the time we get to early 25, they're basically the, the same because it was just kind of a when is the bill coming in question. It came in in the summer versus like at the end of the year. Um, but then you can see that steady growth as we move through this um, positive um, improvement from what we were expecting back in the budget this May. And then if we just look at the, the cash history and projection, um, you know, overall, this is a great positive um, movement forward and, and my roots are being quite positive. Um, just Quickly, briefly touching on, on where we have the, the board case to generate and PTA. You can see the generation rate increasing a little bit over the time horizon compared to what was in the budget. And you can see that the PTA, uh, again, for, for what we currently have modeled, it goes up slightly in 25. I think now we have going down closer to zero based on what was issued last night. Um, and then it's down again, close to zero um, in, in 26. So that's all positive. And then forward price curves, you know, it's been a little choppy, but overall, if you look at the solid lines, which are the, the current forecast versus the dash, which are the historical, um, when we set the budget, you can see that the solid lines are, are pretty consistently below the dash lines um, in line with what I said earlier, that, that forward energy prices have increased a little bit. And that leads me to the last slide. I know I talked a lot, lots of numbers, uh, but take any questions, Jacqueline? All right, yeah. Any questions or comments on the report? Um, so I really like that we look at the slides. Oh, green is good. Red is <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's what I feel like. That's the level of my understanding. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot of complicated things moving around. I'm glad that's helpful. Yeah. Helpful for me too sometimes. Yeah, go ahead, now. Um, this may be a question for, for other folks in the room, um, but does this mean that we are um, kind of recalibrating to get closer to kind of what our original goals were as far as our power mix? Um, because the, the forecast is, is um, because the current you know pricing is favorable and all of that, um, can you give a, kind of a little detail on that? So we spent a lot of time uh, reviewing this presentation ahead of time. I think it's too early to make decisions on this information. And I wanted the takeaway to be more that the trend is looking more positive and not um, so much what the exact numbers are. And we still are planning on bringing this back to the board to make those decisions um, either in January or February. What's modeled there is still a pause for 24, 25, but that 2026 20, number has us returning to our renewable procurement goals. Mm -hmm. um, but the board will get to see it when the numbers are a little bit more um, solid to make actual decisions. We would expect the, the rates for PG need to be finalized in December of this year, mm -hmm. occasionally slingered into January. Um, so at that point in time, once PG has the third rate set, that would be staff for that. Clarity to where the budget is going. Thanks. Any other questions or comments or oh. the board? Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Uh, on the, the deal with, <laughs> with the Sandrini. Operation that California is putting out more solar. Mm -hmm. Does does our San Greeny thing move around and affect with that? That California is putting out more. Yeah. So San Greeny, it you know, back when it was signed in 2019, standalone storage was still like often getting signed as a as a resource. And then in the past few years, we've seen a shift to solar resources only really getting contracts if they're built with a storage facility because there's so much solar going onto the grid in the middle part of the day that that really depresses prices. Um, however, there's two factors that I think make Sandrini a little bit um, less, um, it makes me less concerned about that for Sandrini in particular. One is that staff, when they signed the PPA, they signed it to be financially settled at a trading hub rather than at the exact keynote 
where the energy gets put onto the grid. As you might imagine, a lot of these solar resources get built right next to each other in the Central Valley where it's sunny all the time. Um, and then energy prices in that exact location go through the uh, the floor, just you know, plummet into to negative values. Um, however, since Sandrini is financially settled as a trading hub, it's not just solar value that is uh, determining the price of that trading hub, but also thermal resources and other resources that are putting energy onto the grid at the same time. So that pushes the trading hub price up. It may still go negative, but it won't go negative to the same level that you know at San, that Sandrini actually puts power onto the grid for the So that makes Sandrini less exposed to negative pricing than the other was, would once be um, as a solar resource. So that's a really great um, piece of the, the DTA. The second piece is that um, you know staffs were like, oh, we have this big solar resource coming online and we don't have a battery next to it, and that's a problem. And so they have negotiated with the developer to add a battery onto the resource um, about, about a year from now, that battery should go online. And so when that battery is online, that will again allow um, TEA and staff to help manage the exposure to the negative price um, during the solar hours, because rather than having the solar go onto the grid when the price is quite negative, it can go into the battery and be discharged in the evening when the price is quite high. Um, so I think between those two factors, that, that really protects uh, sand green and, and red from like, from negative price and maybe other parts. Yeah, so that's that answer your question, really, Frank? Yeah. Thank you. And one comment, I'm sorry, I didn't include it. Uh, the cash curves here do not include a increase in the financial uh, security um, requirement. So because that's not set yet, we don't know what that number would be. But you know, if that were to be one million or two million, you would see see the corresponding drop in, in cash on the hand. Do we uh, gain interest uh, on that money that we put aside for the financial security requirement that benefits us? I think we're gonna have to phone a friend on this one. I'd be very surprised if you don't, because that's enough money that it should be an interest bearing account. But Richard or anyone else on staff. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I would have to ask Lori. I think it's been such a small amount. I don't know, you know, it wasn't anything that we were tracking, but I think it's something we would advocate for if we're having to post. Lori's online. Oh, oh, perfect. Thank you. Lori, you can unmute and speak. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so we, we do earn a small amount of interest that I uh, record every month and it shows up on our um, profit and loss statement as interest earned. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Or we can open it up to the public as well. Are there any public comments on our quarterly report? Anybody online? Mm -hmm. No. Um, all right, and then I think we take a, a motion to accept this report as well. We have a motion, a second, and a second. Um, Director Bauer and second by Director Mobley. Uh, we're all here, so show of hands, all in favor, aye. Unanimous. Um, thank you, Jacqueline, all right. and all this information on the page. But well, we'll, as Cherry said, I don't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Dumbing it down. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, all right. So that's going to take us to item 6.2, um, which is going to be a motion to reconsider um, the statewide allocation of attributes from the Adlo Canyon nuclear plant due to some general confusion and issues with voting last time. Um, I guess I can make a motion. <laughs> I'm going to make a motion to reconsider um, this this item, and hopefully there's somebody out there that wants to second that. But uh, I'm just going to explain a, a little bit more to it. I think that now we have a little bit more information um, from our CAC, and also actually having a full board here to discuss this item, I think is is going to be beneficial as well. Um, and so sorry to the board members that were here with us last time. Um, for any confusion on that. And so I'm going to make a motion to consider, uh, to reconsider this statewide allocation of quality of carbon free attributes from the Upper Canyon. Is there a second for that? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Director Mobley. 
and it doesn't have to be the second doesn't have to be somebody that was at that meeting. Is that part of the rules? Okay. Um, and then do we take public comment on the motion to reconsider? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll take uh, public comment on this motion to reconsider. Is there any public comment? Not seeing it. None online. All right. Yeah, well, well, there is well, oh yeah. If you're well, the then there will be the item, 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 right? So then we'll yeah on the actual motion at that point. All right. Um. Great. So let's vote on that. All in favor? So we consider the item. I. All right. So that is an all opposed to reconsider, and we have one opposed. All right. And then water district is not voting. Okay, motion passes. Um, and so we will go in. Do we have a staff report or any update? <laughs> uh, while Richard and Faith are coming up, we um, are going to let the board decide whether or not to do a little bit more summary since a lot of you have heard this before. But since we have more people here that weren't here last time, we can get into as much detail as we did the original time. Um, so will be a little bit more interactive of how much uh, background information choose your own adventure <laughs> um yeah i mean i would just go for it you got any folks that weren't here we probably would appreciate that correct yeah yes all right and yes. Yes. i mean did you want to <laughs> offer the first slide like you did with the cac uh sure yeah okay. i chair schaefer uh covered a lot of it already, but um, so we did bring this to the board at September 26. Um, there was uh, an attempted vote that did not pass, um, and the result was uh, not taking action, which was not accepting the application. Um, we did discover process error and uh, misinformation given about uh, the vote count, which we felt could have had bearing on the vote. Um, and the decision was made to bring it back for a motion to reconsider, which you just did. Um, and, you know, as uh, Chair Schaefer mentioned, you know, the, the glass half full is that this did allow us time to take it to the community advisory committee and get input. Um, and so we've, we've had a, a more robust community involvement by delaying the decision and coming to reconsider it today. So, it crossed the window during lunch with the policy manager. Um, yeah, so the community advisory committee did choose to recommend that the board accept the allocation. So, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, I know. Pointing. Working? No question. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. okay. Thank you. So the Diablo Canyon power plant is located in Morro Bay and Villa Beach in um, in 3CE's territory, which is Central Coast of uh, Community Energy, was opened in 1985 and provides 10% of the energy to the California energy grid. So it's a pretty substantial um, reliability resource to the state. In 2016, PG&E was the operator of supply and retired the plant with a retirement date of 2025. There's two units in the plant. One was set to be retired in uh, 2025 and the next one was set in 2026, I believe. Um, the reason that they gave is that there was significant increased cost of operations for the plant and it wasn't economically viable. Um, CQC saw that decision in, um, let's see. They saw that decision and approved the application in 2020. And then, uh, in that decision, the CQC, uh, that was in September of 2020, they also uh, ordered for low serving entities in the state of California to purchase replacement resources for Diablo Canyon to, for the same amount of capacity that would have gone up So in August of 2020, just before the CQC decision, there were some pretty severe heat waves and rolling outages in the state of California. Um, and along with an expected delay uh, resources there, and another rolling outage in, in 2022, the legislature passed SB 846 to prevent additional outages. This invalidates the CQC's approval to retire the plant and requires the GD and state agencies to take all actions necessary to extend Diablo Canyon power plant operations. So, for another proceeding, the CQC issued a decision to uh, extend the operations of Diablo Canyon in 2030 with both units coming online slightly different, online slightly different dates. So 
as it stands right now, um, California energy providers automatically receive an allocation of the reliability benefits of Java Canyon that would be the resource out of the CRRA. Um, they have an option to accept clean energy attributes from the plant. So those would go towards our clean and renewable procurement targets. Um, so far, we have not accepted those allocations in past due to our risk policy. Uh, we have 30 days from, there's going to be another allocation window for the extended operations. So this, that's why this is going to court now, is that this is a new window of opportunity to decide whether we're going to take those allocations or not. That allocation should be released any day now, expected in early November, and we'll have 30 days from then to accept or reject the allocation. If it's accepted, we'll just have a new clear shown on our power content label, which goes for customers. And um, if we do not accept it in either case, we will be paying for this model. Our CEA will be paying or the customers are less paying. So just to kind of go into this a little bit further, if we accept the allocation, we receive the clean energy benefits customers are already paid for. No new additional nuclear power gener generation or development will occur. This is an extension that is already approved. So if we don't accept it, they aren't going to retire the outlook and it's still going to continue off it. And it will show up on our power plant. If we reject it, we do not receive the clean energy benefit. We continue to not encourage any additional nuclear power generation or development. And we continue receiving the RA benefits, but we do not have it listed on our power plant. So critics of both scenarios have said that if um, enough LSEs accept the allocation, then it may show to policymakers in the state that there is an appetite for the call. Critics of rejecting the allocation have said that by receiving the RA benefits and not disclosing it on a power content label, that that is not transparent. All right, I'm gonna let this go to the Richard Engel, Director of Power and Resources. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, we've had a, a prohibition since launching our program on including nuclear power in our resource portfolio. And uh, I'll show you the language on that next slide. Um, so uh, to align with that language in our risk policy, um, we've been declining carbon free allocations of nuclear power all along that were available to us the last several years, um, but have been accepting allocations of hydropower because that helps us um, uh, you know, reduce the overall emissions of our portfolio without um, uh, being at odds with anything in our risk policy. Um, this allocation, though, is new because it's tied specifically to that five year extension of uh, the Allegheny's operation that they mentioned. Um, and that, coupled with um, uh, the increases that we've been seeing in resource prices, uh, which, which uh, Jacqueline talked about, the, about that market price benchmark uh, for uh, RPS and for carbon free power as well. Um, uh, this is just motivated us uh, to, you know, be looking at what our alternatives are and seem like it wouldn't be uh, responsible for us to not bring this to the board for, for consideration. Um, so this is what it says in our risk policy. It says uh, that nuclear is not allowed to be part of our portfolio, but it does also have this language about exceptions um, that may be needed for short-term transactions. Um, uh, in consultation with our general counsel, Nancy, we had uh, staff came to the conclusion that um, asking the board to consider this one period of time could be considered a short term transaction. Uh, so we have not brought you a, pro a proposal to approve doing this all the way through 2030 when the applicant closes. Um, we are aware of uh, at least in one or two cases that some of their CCAs have framed it that way as a, a longer term decision that they don't have an explicit prohibition on nuclear in their, their own policies. Um, uh, is it for that one? Um, uh, so uh, when we brought this to the board last month, we framed this as, as three alternatives. Um, under scenario one, um, which is what we came away from the meeting with last time, uh, was just not accepting the nuclear allocation. Um, and uh, the numbers over in the right-hand boxes are updated from what we saw last time, because uh, last time uh, when our financial outlook was worse, those uh, net revenue numbers were all uh, negative numbers, and they're positive now. Um, 
These numbers are uh, just as a note based on over our overall power procurement and power sales revenue. So these numbers are not taking into account, you know, all the other income streams and expenses uh, for RCA overall. This is George's title or uh, expenses and income from our CCA program. Um, if we were going to say yes to nuclear, um, uh, we we saw that as being something that the board could leverage in two different ways potentially. One would be um, just to reduce costs to improve our financial outlook. So under scenario two, um, the way we would manage this is by selling off an equivalent amount of hydropower, um, part of that allocation of energy that we also get from PG. Um, and it's estimated that we could realize about a half million dollars by selling off that equivalent of hydropower for 2025. That's kind of a loose number um, because uh, resources in our portfolio that we can sell off are not just like cash in hand. They're you know, sort of more like owning stocks, you know, you don't really know what it's going to trade for when uh, it's time to unload it. Um, but that's kind of the best estimate of uh, half a million dollars. So you see that uh, that lends us off half a million dollars better in 2025 net revenues. Alternatively, we could look at this as, hey, this is free uh, greenhouse gas, free uh, energy. We can use this to just add to our portfolio, not sell anything else off so that we have lower carbon emissions overall. Um, and uh, as you can see in that case, it lowers our GHG intensity from 308 pounds of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour down to 285. Um, this is a pretty small allocation. Um, it only would make up about 2% of our overall repower portfolio. That's the default portfolio that most of our customers have. We have that uh, opt up repower plus portfolio, and this would not touch that portfolio because that's defined to just be renewable resources only and that it's not not being renewable. Um, so uh, we send out that power content label once a year so people can see what was uh, in the power mix and it's retrospective. Um, so the 2025 power content label won't actually be sent out until kind of third quarter of 2026. Um, so this is just uh, Kind of a for instance of what we think that would look like. These numbers are all really speculative and preliminary because we don't really know what our portfolio will be for 2025, especially if the board does choose to revisit in the next few months, um, you know, going back to our, our uh, renewables procurement goals. But based on our current planning, um, you just see nuclear going from 0% to 2%, and the unspecified power that. Um, uh, that doesn't, you know, the power that's not tied to a specific resource goes down by the same way. Um, so you're probably interested to know what other um, community choice aggregators in the state have decided on this. And we do have uh, fresh information on that since we talked about this a month ago. Um, quite a few of them, MCP serving in Solano, Napa, Marin, Contra Costa, Sonoma serving in Sonoma, Mendocino, Peninsula that serves San Mateo County. Ava that serves Alameda County and some Central Valley communities, uh, the Palm Springs CCA, the Sierra Foothills one, Plaster and El Dorado counties, and Santa Clara counties CCA have all voted to accept the application. Um, uh, we actually have an update to this that I didn't, uh, wasn't able to get into this slide. I uh, just learned uh, from Faith in the last few hours that uh, Central Coast Community Energy, uh, which is the host. Uh, CCA for the site of this project actually is not taking the allocation, um, and, um, and I believe they they just uh, they they are one of the only other CCAs that has a no nukes policy like RCEA, and they just deem the staff level to not take the allocation. Um, uh, other than that, we haven't heard of anybody else declining it so far. Yeah. Uh, they did say that they may consider it in future years. So that's not a no for all five years. That's a no for this first year. Thanks, David. Um, so uh, uh, we did talk this over with the CAC and got, uh, ended up, it was a very, very interesting, thoughtful discussion. Um, in the end, they had eight votes in favor, four opposed, and one abstention. Um, and they did also talk about the um, the policy platform uh, recommendations that we talked with the board about uh, last month, and um, uh, they 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 basically were in agreement with the board's guidance on that, but they didn't want to see 
I was referring to something back to the board for consideration uh, as far as uh, policy platform recommendations that would clarify uh, our position on the nuclear power apart from whether or not we take this allocation. So with that, we're happy to take any, any questions. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Faith. Um, yeah, we'll start with questions, and then I know there's some members of the public that would like to comment. So, are there any questions from the board? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I've had a few people, ratepayers, contact me under the assumption that us accepting the power would reduce their their bills. Um, yeah, the way our, our rate design is currently done, that would not be the case um, because we're just still doing the set discount relative to PG and lease rates. Um, as we've discussed with the board, we're looking at cost of service rate setting um, for the future as an idea and uh, starting to look into that. And there would be, you know, potentially under a cost of service rate setting model. Uh, a bit more of a direct linkage between these kinds of decisions and the rates that our customers take. So it would just be tied to PG anymore. So it's something to consider, but I don't think that we're going to have that in place, uh, you know, on the timeline that it would impact the point of five decision. Okay, real quick though, if we were to pass this along to rate pairs, what would be the hypothetical uh, savings to them? Um, I, I, that's a, I mean, that's, right. that's a tough question, but I'm saying that for the public because I got hammered on this, and I, I would like to keep the understanding. If we were to pass it along, what would that look like? Sure. Well, um, I think there would be some discretion on how that half a million dollar savings that I talked about gets allocated. You know, we always talk about the balance between customer grade affordability and building reserves, and how we really want our portfolio to be. Um, so, you know, I know the board talked last time about, you know, directing the savings to, you know, renewable resources that would be part of what eventually replaces the applicant. So that's one direction to go, the rate savings are another. So if the board decided to focus on rate savings and directed staff to push that money towards rate savings, then we'd have that half million dollars. That's a pretty small rate savings across, you know, 60,000 customers in those. Thank you. We don't know what the increase is going to be to the rate savings, correct? I mean, we, we have no idea because you said that the cost is going to be passed on whether we accept the application or not. And we don't, and it hasn't been determined yet what that would increase would be. Yeah, I don't think we know the exact numbers for how much. Yeah. And, and if we were to use that $500,000 estimate, we're talking about an $8 annual savings per customer if we were. Per year, not per bill, for a whole year, eight dollars. Um, well, you may have mentioned it, but since we don't know what the rates will be in the in the, the, the rates of the set for the future, but I am wondering what um customers have been charged, uh, whether it's a fixed fee on as part of their bill or is it just been folded in with other rates? What is the cost right now that people are paying for? Because you mentioned that we've already been paying for it, right? It's precedent. Yeah, and it's well, unfortunately, it's not like called out as an individual line item. Like there is a nuclear decommissioning line item on customer bills. Um, but um, like this will be folded into this public purpose charge that is a, a mishmash for a bunch of different things. So it won't be like clear visibility for a customer how much my bill is paying for people to get with it. It will just say that the entire procurement costs. On the bills, I'll read the payers' bills. It would it all be pulled to be into the permit costs for the energy. Yeah, I, I believe it's been, yeah, it, it, so it is, and that's yeah. one of the um, unfortunate, not very um, transparent portions of this is that it is lumped in the public purpose charge, which is, you know, wildfire hardening, energy efficiency programs. And to really pull that out, we, I, I don't even think us as a CTA have pulled um, views into those line items. I, you know, I think at some point it's like the CPC has to ask the IOU to, to pull that post out individually. I think we'll have a better idea when we know the exact allocation. Well, no, that's allocations. So 
Yeah. It's another way of teaching you like to trick us. Yeah. The they, reason they I was, can't can I explain why I was yeah. asking it? Um because you know and I'm I'm struggling to articulate this perfectly, but if rate payers are required to pay for an on for ongoing operations in one area, but they're not uh but we you know we're overtly rejecting the quote benefit that comes with it. Is there any kind of legal issue there? That's what I'm trying to understand. And I, I don't know if this has come up for other CCAs, um, whether there's any, uh, you know, if, if we're not accepting that benefit and incorporating it into what the customer receives in some way, shape, or form, but they are indeed paying for it. Like, are we on the, the hook to provide them something of comparable value? Mm -hmm. I guess that's my, my thinking. So you're, you're kind of doing a thought. 26 tax analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I don't think that's it. I don't think it would be applicable okay. because we're talking about PG&E rates mm -hmm. and, and the PG&E costs. Um, we will have to look at this with the cost of service rates um, that our CPA adopts. And I don't I don't know if they schedule Next year, when is that? Um, I well, the plan is to bring before the board a solicitation um, to cover the burden of the analysis for us. Okay. So that's where you will see what the benefits are and the cost, and then the benefits will have to flow to the rate payers. That's a, that, that's a, a more traditional question. So your question might have more validity. <laughs> when you when we're in that world, because I'm thinking about like we, even though we set our rates and we we currently set them to be just below PGMEs, right? We're not off the hook for charging our customers for this, right? Like these 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 elements are still something that our customers. And I guess it's a question: Are we it's, are we required to charge our customers? Yeah, it's through the PG&E portion of the bill. So okay. it's on the PG&E side. Um, I just want to add that they don't take a rate of return on this. Mm -hmm. um, they do get a volumetric performance fee that they can charge on top instead of a rate of return. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be used for programs yet to be determined that may relate to distribution and transmission infrastructure, may relate to battery storage and things administered by PG&E. So we don't get the choice of whether they should charge them. So no, so we don't. It's uh, it's not on the generation side, and and the price that they're charging the customer changes based on what it costs for them to maintain the facility. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't. It back to your point. Is it a fixed charge? I, I don't know if it is on per bill, but per year it's not. It's based on what it costs to maintain. Um, I mean, it part. doesn't make sense in a way that this is coming in to the distribution of transmission. So it seems like it's generation. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it doesn't make intuitive sense, but I get, I understand what you're saying. Um, just one other thing I wanted to offer in response to Director Arroyo's question. Um, I've had some um, customer calls forwarded on to me, so I'm sort of in the one that's, you know, answering questions that are kind of, you know, above the level that our, you know, front desk staff is prepared to handle on the nuclear question. Um, and I have, have had some conversations about that, and a few of the people that I've talked to uh, have just, you know, Expressed, I think they perceive it that way that we're preventing them from getting something that they're that they're paying for, um, and there's a somewhat angry radio editorial that's made on the airwaves that uh, is the community member uh, kind of expressing that opinion. So it's out there, uh, correct or not? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of unspecified power in that we get about thirty percent, kind of like a baloney of all these different power that we're already getting, could it be assume that a portion of that is already in the outlook? Um, Based on the current power content label, any unaccepted allocations of the power from the Yalo go back to PG. So in the current run, not the extended operations, PGME gets all that on their label and it's not unplaced by power. In future runs, uh, for equity reasons that 
unaccepted allocation does not go back to PGME and it does just go into unspecified. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead and skip. Um, is and we don't know what that could be going on. Are we thinking for fifteen to five fifteen as a window, or could it be two things? Um, I I think the, the I think the the band of error could be a little bit larger than plus or minus ten percent. Um, uh, Jack, I don't know if uh, is that something you feel prepared to address, like kind of what the error bar might look like on that half million dollars savings that you estimated. Yeah, I would probably put the error band a bit higher. Um, I'm not sure what the number is, but transacted often um, and likely you know, with this new change it may come back to be more and more hard to make sure. So our at our last meeting we talked a little bit about like how, how could we use this money in, in a positive way. And I I you know did some thinking and had some conversations with some different folks and just because I think it was Elise that brought up the idea of like, can can we spend this money on projects, our own projects, or do our own, you know, something to be able to, because the idea in my head is like, if we want to prevent nuclear power, but the reason it's not going offline is because we haven't built enough renewables to replace it yet, then like, can we, what, like, is it actually feasible that we could invest that money you know, it's five hundred thousand dollars right now, but if it's a million next year and a million year after, you know, that starts to add up to a bit of money. Like, do we realistically invest that in some sort of local solar project? Like, does does that actually make sense as a as a viable option in your opinion or in staff's opinion? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm looking at Eileen because I feel <laughs> that's kind of an ED level question because we have kind of the tripod of you know golden reserves and. Power procurement decisions. I'm more used to the power procurement like that tripod. So. Um, I appreciate this sentiment. I I think our our general purpose of investing our dollars back in the community. We're already doing that. You know, we have our programs that we're investing. We have the feed and tariff program where we're paying a higher rate to encourage local solar. I'm a little um. I'm a little hesitant to do kind of one-off carve-outs of uh, that's dependent on selling a product that we don't really, it's not like Richard said, it's not cashing in, and it's like stocks. Um, so um, I think it should be considered as part of the bigger picture budget and what programs you want to approve for us moving forward um, with the CCA. And, and it could be considered, you know, that it helps our financial picture. So when you're making decisions at mid-year, you know, that you decide you want to invest more in, in projects. I, I'm, I get a little uncomfortable with tying, uh, you know, one kind of energy-related trade to an investment um, back in the community. Because as we see from risk report to risk report, it, it changes. Um, so I, I guess I I wouldn't want that to be the basis of your decision on, on whether or not you accept the salary. Any other questions? Uh, I, I have you something. Yes. So sorry. you're sorry, Elise. Yeah. Really <laughs> <back. laughs> That's the whole for me. Um, Skip asked um, about going back into the unspecified resource. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like um, if we don't accept this, um, in the future, it will not go back to PGE, it will go back to unspecified. And as an unspecified resource, we're going to be getting it anyway. Or not. So, if going on to unspecified resources on the power plant, I think, well, yes, we will be getting it in that way. Assuming that there's surplus power in certain hours, there is an initiative at the CE fleet to reform 
how the emissions are calculated for the power content label. And it's not yet approved. Based on the current system, it's going to be calculated in a different way, but potentially it could be shown as a lower emissions rate than, say, like natural gas, which is what incentivized power is calculated. Can I? I don't know the answer to this question. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if, so what they're asking is it decided on right now, it would not be in our unspecified hour. And yeah. we, have the, we have the ability to make those decisions each year. So, I mean, maybe a simpler way to think about it is for the year that we're making the decision, if we don't accept it, would end up in unspecified hour instead of trying to predict what it's going to be the following year. Okay, the CEC has not yet approved the option for it to go to unspecified power. So as of how it operates currently, it would just go away. Assuming that the CEC approves it, which would be coming before the allocation, then yes, it would go into unspecified power. I'm sorry, but the answer is so <laughs> <laughs> Well, like everything else, yeah, we don't, there's so much, so much we don't know, but it's just a, a, you know, it's a little bit crazy making saying we don't want this because it's bad. And then there are real good chance we're going to do it anyway <laughs> and not have any of the financial benefit. So I think, I think the whole process is a little bit crazy making, um, you know, and, and, you know, anyway, my head hurts, but, uh, but I get it. Uh, just one thought on that is just that 2025 is the last year that that will even matter because 2026 and beyond you'll have no set aside power or portfolio anymore. You know, you've know, seen the graphs and the plan, so it was supposed to actually be 2025 until we had to dial down and prepare it a little bit, but in 2026 onwards, it'll all just be renewable and carbon free and then 2030, renewable according to the trajectory. So it's a very short term. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. That helps. Yes. And then Frank. Um, so I know we're talking about, you know, possibly half a million, maybe, you know, cumulatively a couple of million, depending on, you know, a, a lot of moving pieces, right? Um, I guess my question with all of that is, and that, you know, um, we deal in dark, large dollar amounts here. So that's not a lot. Uh, as far as advancing the project. But my question is, um, do we struggle as an organization the way that other government agencies struggle to find and have access to funding to initiate projects, to do permitting, to do initial partnerships, to kind of do that like project generation phase? Like the way I'm thinking about the housing trust fund that we're you know, striving to set up locally is to fill those gaps in initial startup of projects and um, you know the costs associated with that early, early phase where you're working on something, but there's not yet a funding stream. And I'm wondering if we as an organization struggle with that type of funding and whether um, there's utility in having a funding source that's dedicated to like renewable projects initiation. Um, so the way we procure the long-term projects that we get built in Humboldt County is we're not the ones paying for the permits and all those things directly. We're going out doing a solicitation, finding a company that wants to build a project, and then arriving at a power purchase agreement price per megawatt hour. And then they take that, they actually go out and get financing up front so they can build the project and then recoup the cost of the financing through the the PPA payments that we make over 15, 20, 25 years um, to do that. So um, we're a step removed from directly having to solve those problems like cost of permitting and things like that. That's that's really on the developer. So I don't think that we really have direct access with the exception of like the airport migrant was the one project where we directly have our hands on those things, but usually we're, we're there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think you know, the airport microgrid is a good example. And now with the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of the barriers for us to develop and own have been removed. Um, but uh, we're, we're not, we haven't like stepped into that space yet because we're hoping through our partnership with CC Power and doing it as a group and lessons learned 
reducing some of the risk to RCA as you know going out uh, alone. Um, so in the future, the answer might be yes, but I also back to the Prop 26 question. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, I don't think we know. Uh, maybe, maybe one day. And I hear your reticence to like designate the kind of earmark uh, uh, funds that we are speculative and kind of moving target to a specific you know project or suite of projects or anything like that. But I, I, I did wonder if that was like a gap in the type of resources that we have to meet future needs if we want to initiate more projects ourselves and kind of move in that direction. And that's like a longer term question for the board, but it, it does to me have relevance to this type of thing. Uh, Frank, do you have a question? Yeah, the, kind of back to a little bit about Sherry and uh, it's, it's, it's funny that we're getting, are we getting, we're receiving the credit that we're getting on a distribution level versus they're charging us on, a, I'm sorry, on a distribution level and then we're going to sell off generation value because we get this, we're getting the generation value. That's what, that's what I'm not getting a figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not exactly a TND like transmission distribution charge. It's just it appears on the PGL part of the bill. And there's it's what are called the non bypassable charges, which are the ones that everybody's on the hook for, whether you're a CCA customer or a bundle utility customer. Um, so it's you have to think of it as sort of a different category on the bill from transmission distribution or generation. It's just the kind of other category that's the that, non bypassable charges. And that's where that's the part of the bill where you see the nuclear decommissioning and things like that that are just general expenses that the CDC has deemed that are appropriate for the utilities to collect. So, so it's, not, it's really not a distribution or generation charge. It's a, it's a charge they like to decommission. They can put something yeah. on there, and then everybody in the state of California gets to pay for it. Yeah. And so when we get an allocation, what, what does our allocation come back to? In the, in the, distribution allocation, we're getting this other credit that we can essentially sell off. It's, it's generation, so it's counting towards our power portfolio, but it doesn't show up on the customer bill in any other way except for that that public purpose charge line I talked about that includes this and wildfire mitigation and all sorts of things. Well, it's, 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 and I've said it several times. It's a twisted up, which somebody else, I think, a couple said here. It's a twisted up deal with PG &E. and really the PUC is saying that there's sort of power they want now, and so we're not going to shut it down. We got to figure out a way to make the pay. But uh, when we had Robert and you know, uh, Eileen come down to the last city council meeting in the all and asked them to explain this because it was something I didn't feel that I had the right to just. Because this is a, an issue that's going out amongst the community, the public comment that we'll hear, and other parts that you're getting phone calls, and different things. And it, it, for me to just make this inadvertently by myself, I didn't feel right with that. And so I asked them to come down and give a presentation about this to the, to the council and say, what's the consensus of what you want to do, rather than you just coming out with something? And so they voted. You know, in the consensus to accept the allocation due to the fact that it was receiving a half million dollars back into RCA's funding that we can use. Let's let's throw it away and not get nothing, or let's get a half million dollars to do something with to, to the benefit of the community. And uh, I understand there's the part where it goes out and says, now this is 2% of your portfolio, which is nuclear, and we were never going to have nuclear. The dilemmas go on, but uh, also I think mentioned last. I wasn't in the last meeting, but I heard parts of it over, over the, my phone. Uh, it was brought up that this nuclear power that's being essentially generated is never is never going to come into home account. You know, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but if I would challenge somebody to make those electrons get to home account, I, mean, I think it would be virtually impossible for it to get out of where it's at and make it up the coast in the electron form. Where just like in Kagan in Riddell, we're getting electrons from uh, Humboldt uh, song. 
comes over probably a big portion of whatever they're exporting because they don't export what they used to export ends up in Rio de Janeiro at best it doesn't get, get passports so. and so when you look at the power that is being it makes these lights go on it isn't going to come from down in Canada it's going to go up into the same place or where we get our wind power or solar power so that comes about we're it's still going up into a grid somehow, and then we get credit for it. Then we turn around and sell it and do what we do with it. And so um, that's a whole dilemma with the whole power application. You know, rather than trying to get power like, like a micro grid type situation. But all that aside from babbling on forever, uh, Riddell did make a consensus that they would they wanted to accept this. And so that's why I'm bound to do it. If it's if it's if there's a proposal to accept that. Okay, thank, thank you for clarifying because I I did take it as you babbled on. It's been for a lot of clarify a lot of things. Well, it's not a simple. This isn't by any means simple. And the, and the, the two culprits, I believe, uh, again, somebody has to set the straight. Is one to see the PUC is has a dilemma that they don't have if there's a. If they have the, another heat wave uh, and you've already shut down the application, you don't get the power. And it, and it creates a lot of power for the state of California. And then the, uh, that's probably that's probably where it leads. But then they, they have to find a way to charge it. So they charge San Diego. Those guys got to feel real good about it. You know, that they're getting charged for this allocation. And it, it's got nothing to do with it. So welcome to pg &E and and the PNC. Okay. Um, let's open it up to public comment. Let's hear from the public here. Um, if you want to comment on this item, you will have three minutes. You can make your way to the podium. Please go through the podium. No raisers, well, I'll go be raised up. I'll unfold myself. Thank you. Please go. I'm uh, Dennis Leonardi. Before I start, I want to congratulate you all for making an excellent sleep against her selection for Elizabeth for your record. She'll do an absolute fabulous job, and I think she was on that CAC for a while and uh, had a lot of comments when she had sick. Anyway, um, I'm glad you're not going down the rabbit hole having to make a nuclear discussion, whether it's good or bad or whatever. This is um, this is a, a, a simpler decision, I think, and I hope you don't overthink the thing. This is like somebody giving the family a gift to make your family better, and this is one you take. Um, it's it, it's not a, and I was on the prevailing side of the CAC voting, but one of the things, the RSC has got a good thing going. You're a young organization, you have a lot of positive stuff, you have great staff, you have great need, and a great vision. Um, next year, maybe it's, I don't know, I was asked this question of Richard. It's uh, this is only one one reactor for a portion of the time. Next year will be maybe both reactors longer. So half a million this year, maybe a couple million next year. You're short on reserves. Take the money, strengthen your organization. Um, work to tomorrow. I mean, if you go this way, when we discussed it, C and C we had read numbers that we were looking at. These numbers look better, but you make your organization stronger because people, I mean, there's always somebody's going to complain. Somebody's going to pick up the phone and say, you're a dummy, you're stupid, you're doing the wrong thing on one side or the other. Your fiduciary role is to make this organization strong, live to tomorrow, and accomplish your goals. You are incrementally. Uh, there's ups and downs. But the time I've been here, you've been doing great. And this is a gift. Take the gift for what it is. Uh, you're going to get some criticism, build your organization, build it strong, and you'll have a better uh, you'll have a better future and achieve your goals. So I think you should take the allocation, um, take a couple lumps, but know you're doing the right things. You're building on tomorrow, and tomorrow's going to you know you know satisfy the goals you get set out, which are very laudable. And um, I think if you ask regular members of the community, they're going to tell you that. Not the complainers that sit in the pajamas behind the screen. The guys that are working every day want a strong organization that delivers a quality product with qualified staff that can 
answer a question when you have it. So that's my recommendation. Just, you know, don't look back, take the gift, move on. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Public comments. I didn't want to come on this soon because I wasn't here for the last meeting. My name is Joanne McGarry. I live in Arcata. I was on a bus and a train down to Southern California and I passed the Martinez refineries and the windmills and solar panels of the Central Valley and did see Sandrini down near Bakersfield because it was nighttime and I don't know where it is actually in Kern County, but um, ended up in Los Angeles where I grew up. <clears throat> but um, one of the things that really concerns me about uh, adding nuclear energy concept to Humboldt County, the outlaw county that Brett McFarland just made a great song about, um, is that we can do better and different. And what always seems to be missing when I come to these meetings is the word conservation. I just came from the university and hopped on a bus to get here. And I passed all these rooms with all these screens going. And I actually tried to knock on the door of the shop center and it was locked. So I couldn't even ask a question about energy consumption at our CSU up there on the hill. Um, and it's, it's concerning me that we're talking about uh, something that we can't change apparently because of the Dodds uh, SB bill or whatever that was passed that extends the uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear um, operation. But I've been against this from the get-go in my college days at Avalonia Alliance uh, when we went down there protesting and having Jackson Brown and all these people sing songs. And, um, you know, nuclear energy is not the future for me and conservation is. And we as people in Humboldt County need to really recognize that we can do it differently, better. We don't need this blood money, in my opinion. And I was in Santa Barbara for seven years and five fires, by the way, and got to know these group in uh, San Luis Obispo, called Mothers for Peace for years, decades. Mothers for Peace has been working to close down Diablo Canyon. And I looked at their website yesterday. Diablo Canyon is full, it's falling apart. We should not be supporting that operation in any way what, whatsoever. Please, humble, do it differently. We don't have to go along with Marin Sonoma, with Mendocino, and all those others. For the people of the Central Coast down there where Diablo Canyon is, so many of those people do not want this uh, operation to continue. I know the bill says it must, but we don't have to be a part of it. Hi, I'm Deborah Dukes. I'm on the CAC. I'm on the Eureka Energy Committee, and I'm on the steering committee of 350 Humboldt. Um, I too was in the majority of the CAC vote. Um, I'm a retired teacher, and much I, I don't know some percentage of my pension comes from fossil fuel investments, which burns me up. That said, I accept that money every month, and then I spend my time volunteering to do things like this, fighting against fossil fuel. Nobody consulted me on whether we should pay for the decommissioning of the Avalon Had they asked me, I would have said no. I would, emphatically, I would have said no. However, I'm paying for it, and I'm un as unhappy about that as I am about my Calister's pension being invested in fossil fuels. Um, for the same reason, I don't think we should turn down the allocation. We're paying for it. Um, we are not going to make a difference in how long the nuclear reactors go. We're not going to make a difference in what the PUC decides. We're not going to make any difference in what PGE decides. Um, I think we can take that money, just as I take my blood money, and use it um, in more constructive ways. I understand not taking a, a bucket of money, a specific bucket of money, and doing this. 
but I believe in what our CBA is trying to do. I also believe that it was very wise to put in with that uh, phrase about uh, exceptions. And I think you can come back to this um, yearly as things change. Um, I too sat through all the red numbers um, at the CAC presentation, and I'm delighted to see they're green now. Um, I too like red and green. <laughs> um, and, but I also have seen how it seesawed back and forth. And it's not a lot of money in terms of your budget, but you don't want it all to <laughs> <laughs> I don't have <laughs> reservations. <laughs> so I would just suggest that you take it. I, I like this scenario too. Um, all other things being equal, I am <laughs> against nuclear power. Um, I would never ever vote or do anything uh, to um, prolong that. But again, nobody consulted me. And I say, take the money, put it to good use, strengthen your organization, as Dennis said, strengthen our organization, and um, then use that money to fight against nuclear power. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, anybody else here in person? Not seeing anybody. Is there anybody online? Okay, we have Mike Wilson online. Mike, if you can hear us, you can unmute. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, wow. Um, I really want to appreciate the board um, taking this time and to re-look re at this issue. Um, as many of you know, I was an alternate uh, there last month, and, um, and we had made the decision we made uh, based on the information given. And I... I I wanted to because it seemed at that time that that we were moving towards denial, and I wanted to make that st statement as strong as possible uh, in relation to uh, our policy and our our practice around uh, rejecting nuclear power in Humboldt County. Um, but there was something that was said at that meeting uh, from uh, Director Scafani from Blue Lake that that I had to think about sort of the next day as I was um, driving to somewhere out, out in the desert somewhere about you know taking that resource and using it to create uh, renewable capacity in Humboldt County. And I thought that was an interesting concept because it seems like that uh, the, the whole reason uh, why we were in this position is because there wasn't enough re renewable capacity, renewables capacity to replace Diablo Canyon. And I think that's that's a real thing. And so I do think that if the board decides today to take this allocation, uh, I, I, I think that, that there could be policy created that could move it in that direction. I do understand the unease of interim executive director Verbeck about that policy implication and about sort of the bucket and where it might go. I think that those are that's a reasonable conversation that the board could have in the future, or maybe not necessarily in this moment. But I do think that there that that resource can be done in a way that's financially positive for the customers in the long term, creates reliability and a more robust system locally. Uh, it could include, uh, as brought up, conservation and those sort of things. But anyways, it's it's bringing it's bringing together. Uh, a direction uh, from this, which also creates in and of itself a statement and could also be created and could include a challenge to other CCAs to do something similar that where if they're feeling unease in this, that they too could also move to use this resource in a way uh, to create more renewables. Uh, again, conservation, I think, is, 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 is something that also could be looked at. Um, and so I just wanted to Put out those thoughts, and I, I am just so thankful for the really robust discussion and the and the thoughtfulness from everybody in the community uh, on this really important issue. And those are my comments. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? On yes, we have uh, John Rudder. John, you can unmute. Uh, yes, can you hear Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, my name is John Rutter. I'm a student at HSU, and 
as a well, as a customer of the RCEA, uh, I believe that you should accept the allotment. I am very pro-nuclear, uh, though I also understand people's hesitancy to accept it. Uh, regardless, accepting it will be beneficial, as you've seen from the expected increase in revenue for uh, the group. Uh, as you can easily invest that into as many people as suggested into renewable energy for the community and thus making us more self-reliant and hopefully getting more customers away from pg and &E. That's all I have to say. Thank you. That's it. All right. I will bring it back to the board for any further discussion, questions, comments. <laughs> Um, motions, questions, comments, all those things. Go ahead. Well, about a couple of comments. Um, I am leaning in favor of accepting it, and it's not um, because I am for nuclear. Um, and I think, you know, this is the third meeting where we've had a chance to kind of uh, talk about it. I missed the last one, but. Um, uh, my, my feelings are similar to the first time that we brought this up, um, but a little more nuanced. And I appreciate that there was um, discussion of how, since the, um, you know, the um, the risk management policy really is so slim when it comes to nuclear. It just says we won't take nuclear power. Uh, there's there's no rationale given. There's no additional policy statement associated with that. So it sounds like one of the recommendations was, um, you know, to to uh, especially something that the CAC liked to see was, was a, an additional policy statement around nuclear. And I think that that would behoove us to develop that, um, you know, that we oppose and to be overt about opposition to development of new nuclear power generation facilities and the desire to see responsible disposal. And I think we all know there is no responsible disposal option. So certainly I, I at least don't want to see an additional nuclear power development. Um, but that said, um, you know, I think if we add a little information to that, so it's very clear and we're signaling to potential future developers that that's not something that we, you know, uh, support, that that adds a little to it. Um, it's nice to see, honestly, where the other CCAs landed. Um, I find it, you know, I think they're all probably going through much of the same conversation and I find it, um, you know, helpful to know kind of where they're at. Um, I do think if we were to accept it, that in this particular instance, it would behoove us to try to keep those funds that are generated from this whole transaction somehow separate for the purpose of making a decision as a board about how that should, how that should work, whether it's investment in local microgrids or matching funds for other locally owned and operated projects that would maybe be or the you're the leader of um, rather than a private you know, company or meeting these new financial security requirements that we just heard about um, where there's a lot of uncertainty. So, um, you know, I think there's probably many good uses, but um, my, my thinking is to develop that policy statement in pretty short order and um, determined to keep those funds somewhat separate so that our board can decide how to use Mm -hmm. All right. Other comments? Oh yes. I love the way you read it. I I have a lot to say, but the train was still down. I mean, I appreciate the CAC. I appreciate all you've done to to mold this over and um, recommend approval. You know, I'll I'll go back to some of my comments from last time. And, you know. Calling this a clean energy benefit, I have I struggle with that. Actually, I don't struggle with it. I, I disagree with that. It's something that produces waste that lasts forever, essentially. Um, I understand we have a fiduciary responsibility. But that said, you know, fiduciary responsibility is what gave us key laws in the DDT in the corporate interest of making money, right? They, they do things that are their fiduciary responsibility as a corporation, which leads to all kinds of horrible things being left behind for us to deal with. So, you know, um, I get, um, you know, thinking of this as a, in the short term, 
Like, if anything, you know, I'm looking at this annually, I, that's the only way I would uh, agree to something like this. Um, you know, it, it's just a struggle thinking about, you know, accepting something that will have forever, which is a good way. So, um, but I appreciate staff and uh, what they've brought you know forward and you know, discussion about it. And but yeah, I would like to see the benefits, you know, go to renewable and you know, you know, renewable energy, procurement, development. I know we can't really look at it that way necessarily, but we should be thinking of that so that we can get out of this as quickly as possible. This this uh, acceptance of nuclear power. I always want to say when we make this decision, we need to think about what are our rate payers going to think when they see nuclear on top of bills. We think the majority of our population doesn't like it in some fashion. You know? It's the it's the uh, Falshin bargain. Maybe? I don't know if that's the proper term for it. You know, I'm accepting something because there's money there. I I have a hard time with it, but. I'm happy to entertain a, a, a motion that um, entails all that because I think we need to do more than what is before us right now, more nuance and more um, uh, something that we can look at really. Think about. Yes. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I, you know, because I, you and I were both of, of the anti nuclear. Um, persuasion last time and you know that that's kind of where I'm sitting is that like I don't really see a direct way to specifically take this money and counteract the things that we want to see go away like nuclear power um and, and I really appreciate what you said Scott just about you know the understanding that we obviously have a fiduciary obligation to care about the, the financial health of our organization, but also, you know, as all elected officials and people sitting on this board that we also, you know, from a policy standpoint, need to like uphold the values of our organization and our communities that we represent as well. And, you know, it might just more be a uniquely arcade thing, but I have gotten a lot of feedback of, I'm so glad you guys didn't accept that their allocation and maybe, you know, in other communities you guys aren't hearing that after your last meeting, but that, that might be a uniquely Arcata thing, um, or at least the people that I, I talk to and work with a lot in Arcata. So, um, and, and really, you know, not seeing a direct route, or at least in this, you know, particularly recommended motion of, you know, moving the way that I think we need to, which is like, how can we become more independent from g &E, for example, have more of our own resiliency and independence with energy where we're not reliant on, on resources like the Diablo Canyon and being able to bring online our own resources and projects locally. So I, you know, I, I would be inkling to, to support in the back of my head if there was, you know, some clear direction that that money could really be spent locally in our community and the city we brought to us, but, you know, that, that's not necessarily what I'm hearing is a possibility. So. That's where I'm sitting. Yeah. yeah. So um, 20, 20 years ago, I would say, we count all some of this, but I would go to Avila Beach all the time. I would, I knew the nuclear power plant was across the across the mountain, and I was spiritual of it. I just hated knowing that. And at that time, I had no idea what I wanted to do in my career, so I got into renewable energy. And um, 20 years later, I'm amazed about how much solar and battery storage is getting uh, put on the grid in 2024 right now. I mean, what we're doing right now, we're driving down the costs significantly to the point where nuclear, we'll not, we'll not even talk about nuclear in 2030. It's, it's, it's a dead technology. So no, if I vote today a positive for nuclear, it's not, not that I'm supporting nuclear in any way. It's knowing that there is a future ahead of us and it's going to be solar and storage. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah. More comments? Motion to think. Um, so. Yep. We're going to figure out an identification. Yeah. Go ahead, Skip. Please. Go ahead. I am more. I want 
I would just say one, I, I mean, I heard what Arlene said about, about um, isolating the savings or potential savings for any particular purpose. Um, and I suppose six months from now or a year from now, we can look back and say, oh, it looks like that that situation, you know, if, if you were to accept this, that we did save X number of dollars or whatever. I mean, we don't have to decide today or next month or the month after what we're going to do with the money we don't have yet. But a year from now, we can look back and, and maybe have a more concrete idea of what that was and decide to put it toward development of local generation or whatever. Um, so I'm still... I'm still um, in favor of however that could make sense um, and the logistics of it, if there's a way to do it, you know, some, at some point down the line where we actually can identify that money um, and put it toward a, a purpose of local generation. That's, that's still my, um, my preference. Can I can make a motion that might work for us? First, I know I was not the last meeting, but I was. I am a CAC liaison, so I did get the presentation with them. Was part of their or listened to their text discussions that they had. Staff did a great report. The CAC committee does amazing what they do. Um, I would like to make a motion to accept the nuclear allocation scenario number two, with the caveat that we review this every year, and that when we review it next year, we will have a knowledge of the funds. That were received, and we can make a decision moving forward how we might want to allocate those funds. I would second that. Right. We have a motion to second on the part. Now, ladies, have a want to make a last comment on that. Was the last part of it something about a policy statement for the risk management policy? Uh, clarifying our position on that here. I thought that was something um, different, or is that we part of this? We got direction in. Last meeting to bring it to our policy platform to um, have to, to bring that back to the board. We already have that touch. Thank you. Would you be willing to add to the motion that the so scenario two uses the allocation to reduce costs so that cost savings be um, kept separate to the extent possible so that the board can determine how we want to utilize those funds? Rather than just seeing an overall cost savings, that's just sort of um, what well, we have to wait to see what we're going to receive because it's unknown. Right. Yeah, whatever that is. Right. I, I, I think what I'm hearing is the report out of mm -hmm. like, what exactly those cost savings were mm -hmm. for that, from that transaction. Is that uh -huh. All right. We have a motion by Director Mobley and a second by Director Sapani. Uh, we'll do a show of hands vote. So all in favor, aye. Raise, raise your hand. All right, and it's great to think about it. Oh, man, am I going to do your human thing? All right, so we have, uh, are you getting that count? It's everybody but me. <laughs> And one and one of those. Thank you. And and yeah, one of it. And so that motion carries. Sarah. Sarah. All right. What were you asking? It was asking. It was a All right. What was that? 
Okay, um, that's going to move us out of CTE business. There is no new CTE business, and that's going to take us into the old business and new business uh, 9.1, which is going to be a summary of our CEA related kind of action plan presentation. Sarah, can I, I would like to thank staff for yes. bringing this back so many times and clarifying so much information. It was very helpful. All right. And yeah, and between us and the CAC, too, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you don't see it all. Um, all right, uh, so Faith, you're going to come back up and tell us about the cap. Thank you. Hello. Um, so RCA has been engaging very closely with the county through the drafting of the cap. We have, before you, you have a staff report that reviews a list of the measures in which RCA is named. We are in a um, legal before those measures, like the remaining measures, we are in support goal collaborating with other agencies. Um, we are named in um, quite a few of the measures you may notice the majority of them, but we are excited to continue collaborating with the town on this. Um, from what we hear, there's going to be an implementation committee being at house at HBOC, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Really quick, I just, we wanted to just provide a summary from RCA's standpoint of the measures that will directly impact work that we do, um, because we know that you're seeing this from your member agencies um, that, you know, maybe not through the RCA board of director lens. Um, it's our um, understanding that the regional, I, I call it climate committee, but I think of it wrong, it's RCC. Yeah. Um, will really house uh, you know, the um, coordination of the implementation measures and um, you know, RCA listed as participating on that committee and um, uh, just wanted to let the board know that we've been really uh, tracking, engaged, providing input and edits. And, um, we feel that many of the measures uh, really are in line with our existing strategic plan, the repower plan, and we're looking forward uh, to seeing this adopted and, and, and working towards it with our, uh, with our partners. Um, any questions about anything in the SAS report? I think. I know all of us commonly do, do see this a lot in our other agencies and get to be deep in the info. All right. Um, then are is there any public comment on this summary? Thanks. Not seeing any any online. All right. Uh we will move then to staff reports, uh 10.1. And I don't think you do have anything to report to us. Um, so just wanted to take this opportunity to remind the board that we're uh, meeting at different times for November and December um, because of the holidays. Um, so if it's not on your calendar, reach out to us and we can um, hold those times. We're looking at me. I know we are. November is a week early. And the oh, Wednesday. Like Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, wait, not Wednesday. Yeah. Why? <laughs> um, we made that decision. We sent out a poll when we were picking the dates, and the third Thursday conflicted with multiple board directors. H. Um, H. Yeah. So we set these dates. So both myself and Michael can up will be our contacts. Okay. Uh, I Set up in a total, but that's so also that very good at an account at the same time. So, yeah, okay. So, so I just that's our I, that's our first equity or get a meeting with like our new uh like manager staff that we just hired, and that might have a council meeting immediately following that. That we are starting at five, so I just don't think it's feasible. Me and me. Um, I guess saw it is available. We'll we, share it up. If we don't have county and city, will we still have a quorum? 
Is that my, my alternate might be able to go, but she, again, we have a council, so she would oh. have to be there. Mm -hmm. We would not. Do we want to consider setting a different meeting? Yeah. <laughs> is that so? Um, is there a way we can ask us to set a different meeting and set it at the meeting? Yes. Okay. So that we can yes. thank you. Yeah. out yeah. Uh, a new poll. And uh, so let's, so that's for November, well, TBD, and then December, December 18th, 19th, 20th, 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 20th. the exact same conflict, but um, <laughs> less of an important meeting that I could probably miss that one. Well, it's actually our data is the comp that I mentioned. Did you say you sent this out in January? That's we probably went in the date, yeah. in January, so we might have to. Can we just do a, a new poll for both? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. So okay. can we take those off? Or... <laughs> is it safe to do that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even in case uh, there isn't a better option. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I just want to put out there for the poll making that the previous, the Wednesday before each of those dates is wide open for, for me and we have a conflict with the equity. Yeah, and doesn't put up a conflict with the equity. So, like December 11th and uh, November 13th, but that would mean that we would be, anyway, I don't know if that works for others, but yeah, okay, pushing that out a little bit. That's that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then, oh, sorry, I just okay. want for a quick update. Uh, yesterday, myself and uh, two other RCA staff members, along with the uh, Shops Energy Research uh, Center staff, visited Hoopa uh, and met with the Hoopa Valley um, Tribal Council. And then we went from there to Happy Camp and that was another group. Uh, Tribal Council to discuss the terrorist project and introduce ourselves and get a little face time in front of the Tribal Councils. Uh, both tribes are very interested in uh, membership of our CEA. And so I'll be following up with uh, engaging with them on uh, you know, what that means and bringing that back to the <laughs> And then any future agenda items folks are interested in? If not, oh, is that a hand? We are adjourned.